electron configurations. So brief review, quantum mechanical theory describes the behavior of electrons and atoms. It is convenient for us to think of electrons as orbiting the nucleus like planets orbit the sun, but that's not what they're doing. That is useful for some things. But the electrons exist within orbitals. So they are basically a wave, like a standing wave, but the shape is not two-dimensional like a sine wave that you would see with a piece of string vibrating up and down. It's a three-dimensional shape, and those are the orbitals. So when we um, identify which orbitals have electrons in them, that's called an electron configuration. It describes the orbitals that are occupied by electrons in a given element. So here is the electron configuration for hydrogen. This one's very simple. There's only one electron. So that one electron is in the first principal energy level in the only sublevel in that principal level, and there's one electron in there. So here we have the principal quantum number, the letter designation of the orbital, and a superscript, the number of electrons. Um, you can do calculations with Schrodinger's equation for hydrogen, and those calculations show that that one electron in hydrogen is, is occupying the lowest energy orbital. So like many things in nature, things tend towards the lower energy. You know, you, you put a ball on the side of a hill, it rolls down to lower potential energy. It doesn't roll up the hill. Schrodinger's equations for all other atoms with more than one electron can't be exactly solved. They can be approximated, but they can't be exactly solved. There are additional terms um, that have to be added in and because of interactions between the electrons, and so that makes things very much more complicated. But the approximate solutions show that those orbitals are like hydrogen. So we can just kind of think of the hydrogen orbitals and be okay with it. So two important concepts are um, electron spin and energy splitting. So for the spin, spin is a fundamental property of electrons. Um, it's convenient to think of them as spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, like a top. Uh, that's not exactly what it means, but it's good enough. So that spin quantum number, m sub s, there's two possible values, plus one half or minus one half. We can also represent electrons in orbitals using orbital diagrams. And so this is more of a picture method, and this is the orbital diagram for hydrogen. We have one box representing a 1s orbital, and the electrons are shown as half-headed arrows. So the arrow pointing up, we've decided that's the plus 1 half, and if the arrow's pointing down, that would be minus 1 half. If you look at a group of hydrogen atoms, each of those atoms has one electron. About half of them are spin positive, and about half of them are spin negative. Yes? Um. I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but when you, in each box you write one up and then one down, mm -hmm. say you get to like three, three S, and can you just have one more electron to put in there? Do you always put the first one as pointing up, or can you put one? You, like, by convention, one? by convention, we always put the first electron pointing up. Okay. Yeah. So Pauli exclusion principle says no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. So in a given orbital, the principal quantum number is the same. I forget the names of them. We'll just go with N, L, and M sub L. Um, N is the same, L is the same, M sub L is the same. And so the fourth quantum number has to be different. I think of these. Um, set of four quantum numbers as being a little bit like your social security number or your student ID number. There, there can only be one for each person. You can't have two people assigned the same social security number. That's going to cause some problems. Each electron has its own set of four quantum numbers, and that combination is unique. So each orbital can only have two electrons in it, 
and they must have opposite spins, one plus and one minus. So if we know how many orbitals are in a sublevel, then we can figure out how many electrons are going to be in the sublevel, because each orbital is two electrons. So if you have one orbital, you've got two electrons. We'll just jump to the end. If you have seven orbitals, you get 14 electrons. So helium has two electrons. Let's look at the quantum numbers for those two electrons. Here's the orbital diagram. Here's the electron configuration. Those two electrons are going to occupy the orbital with the lowest energy. That's going to be in the lowest um, principal energy level. So um, quantum number one, so n equals one. And when n equals one, the only possible value for L is zero. And if L is zero, the only possible value for m sub L is also zero. So, so far, both of these electrons have the same quantum numbers, one, zero, zero. The last one has to be different. So one of them's plus one half, one is one, minus one half. And so in the diagram, we have one pointing up and one pointing down. So do you remember the uh, quantum hotel? So I really like the orbital diagrams. In the quantum hotel, the orbital, uh, that little box, the orbital is a bed. Okay, so here's, you know, the pillow. And the first electron comes into the room, and he's going to go to sleep, and he's going to lay down in the bed. He's going to put his head on the pillow, right? The next electron comes in, and he has to sleep in the same bed with this other electron, and uh, so he sleeps upside down. Just, you know, we're not doing anything here. We're just sleeping, okay? We don't want any confusion about this. We are just sleeping. So by convention, we put the first arrow pointing up. This first guy who goes in to sleep in the bed, is he going to sleep upside down in the bed? No, he's going to sleep right side up, right? The next guy who comes in ends up upside down. Um, the sublevels in each principal energy level of hydrogen all have the same energy. So if you go up to the second level where you have an S sublevel and a P sublevel, they have the same energy. The energy for orbitals in hydrogen only depends on the principal quantum number. We say that those orbitals with the same energy are degenerate. So they have the same energy, degenerate. When you have more than one electron, then the energies of the sublevels get split. This is caused by charge interaction, by shielding, and by penetration. So in general, if you're looking within a given principal level, um, energy will increase in this order, S, P, D, F. So as L gets larger, because this is L equals 0, 1, 2, and 3, Larger L means higher energy within a principal energy level. Uh, we need to visit Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law gives us um, a relationship between the potential energy of two charged particles. So if the particles have opposite charges, they're attracted to each other, like two magnets, north and south pole, they're going to stick together. There's a force of attraction. If you put the two north poles together, it's very hard to squeeze them together because there's a force of repulsion. It's the same sort of relationship for electrical charge. So the potential energy is um, related to, it's proportional to the charges. So if you have higher charges, the attraction or repulsion is larger, and it's inversely dependent on the distance between them. The farther apart those charges are, the lower the attraction or repulsion. So in a multi-electron atom, we've got a given electron experiencing an attraction to the positive nucleus and repulsion from the neighboring negative electrons. So two negative electrons they're going to repel each other. That's why they end up sleeping upside down in the bed. 
So the repulsions can cause a shielding effect um, and cause the electron to get a net reduced attraction to the nucleus. We'll get to a picture in just a minute. The uh, total amount of attraction that an electron feels is called the effective nuclear charge. Um, I'm going to go over here, look at the picture first. So here's, what element is this? Lithium. So we've got a positive three charge in the nucleus, three protons, three electrons. The first two electrons are occupying the lowest orbital, which is the 1s orbital. And that third electron has to go up to the second energy level. So the second energy level is going to be a little farther from the nucleus. As this electron looks at the nucleus, he's like, oh, you know, you look good. I'm attracted to you. But then there's these two guys around in here. And so these two electrons effectively negate two of the positive charges. That's the simplest way to think of it. So we've got the, the positive three charge, and then we've got those two electrons. So we put in the, the negative two charge, and then we have overall a plus one charge. And so this electron is not, doesn't experience as much of an attraction. The potential energy of that attraction is less than we might expect based on the charges of plus three and minus one because these shield it. Another way, I'm not sure this is a great way, but so you think of this as a very attractive woman, perhaps. And here's this guy. Well, if, if this woman puts on a parka, right, big old parka, and she's got the hood up, and you barely see her face or anything, she's not going to appear as attractive to him as if she was wearing, say, a bikini or something, right? Like, that's hot. I'm all about the parka. All parka. <laughs> You guys would be. You guys would be. But you get the idea. You get the idea, right? So um, if this electron can come in closer, if it can penetrate this orbital, now not only is the distance less, that increases the force of attraction, but also the shielding effect is reduced or gone. Okay? So the electron is able to get into this area, and so the shielding is gone, and it exper experiences the full positive three charge. You guys are smiling. I am not going there. I am not. Okay? So the closer an electron is to the nucleus, the more attraction it experiences. The better an outer electron is at penetrating the, the electron cloud of the inner electrons, the more attraction it will have. So how much penetration there is for that orbital is related to the orbital's radial distribution function. I know you'll be glad to see this graph. All right, ooh, that looks fun. Total radial probability um, versus distance from the nucleus. So here's the 1s orbital. It had zero probability of the electron being at the nucleus, but then the probability goes way up as you get a little bit further away, and then um, there's a maximum, and then it begins to decrease again. For the 2s orbital, that is also spherical, but there's a node. And so it's zero at the nucleus. The probability goes up, back down where this node is, and then it goes up. And this is where most of the electron density is, but there's some over here. It has penetrated the 1s orbital space. Okay, so. Here, the distance is small to the nucleus, and the shielding effect is gone. Um, and so the, the 2s orbital experiences more attraction than the 2p orbital. So the 2p orbital also penetrates that electron cloud, but not as deeply as, as the 2s. And so in the, in the hydrogen electron, in the hydrogen electron, in the hydrogen atom, where there's only one electron. There's no interaction, there's no shielding or anything like that. So the 2p and the 2s orbitals have the same energy. When you have more electrons, when you've got an electron out here and you've got electrons in the 1s orbital, we have these interactions, and this causes a difference in energy between the s and p sublevels within the same level. 
Yes. So as L increases, there's higher energy. As N increases, is there higher energy too? Yeah. So the general trend, um, if you just look at N and you go up from 1, 2, 3, 4, it, the energy increases. Okay. Within a level, L going up, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, it increases. As we'll see in a minute, um, those two trends kind of overlap with each other and get a little ugly. But. Yeah. So, so this is why the S&P orbitals, S&P sublevels are not degenerate in most atoms. Um, so that was looking at the first and the second principal levels. As you, um, as you increase the principal level, the difference in energy becomes uh, less and less. It's still increasing, but the change is less. And so when you get up into the fourth and fifth principal levels, the effects of the penetration become much more important. And so then we get some overlap, and we, we find that the 4s orbital is actually lower in energy than the 3d orbital. And the 5s is lower than the 4d. So it gets a little complicated and to make matters even more fun. And the relative energy ordering can actually vary among elements. Um, I'm just going to tell you that happens, and now we're going to ignore that. Okay, so this is how it falls out. As energy increases, going up this way, here we see the 1s sublevel, the 2s sublevel. The 2p sublevel is a little higher because um, it doesn't penetrate as well as the 2s. Then we get 3s and 3p. We would expect that 3d would be next. But the 4s orbital is really good at penetrating that 1s orbital, getting in there closer. So the 4s sublevel is lower in energy than 3d. And so it goes 4s and 3d and 4p and 5s and 4d. There are different ways to remember that. I'll be showing you how to figure it out on the periodic table. It's actually hiding up there. It's been up there all semester, just sitting there. So. The Aufbau principle says that electrons are going to occupy orbitals in a way that they minimize the energy of the atom. So we're going to see that lower energy orbitals fill before higher energy orbitals. So within a, within a sublevel, the orbitals are degenerate. So if we look at these D, each of these lines represents one orbital. Together, it's the sublevel D. Each of these orbitals, though, is the same in energy. So that's something to be thankful for. The orbitals can hold no more than two electrons, and they have to have opposite spin. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. And then Hun's rule tells us that when we're filling those degenerate orbitals, we fill them singly first with parallel spins, and then we, then we go in and put the, um, the matching ones in. And so that makes sense in my... Uh, in my quantum hotel, well, I should maybe should have done a different color, but that's okay. It's kind of look like sandwiches, but they're not. Um, so if these were three orbitals, maybe they are the 2p orbitals, and electrons are coming in, and the first electron, uh, so these are the beds, right, and this electron goes in, it's like he's going to sleep right side up in this bed. Now think about it. You're going into a hotel room. There's three beds. There's a guy sleeping in this bed. Are you going to go climb in upside down with him when there's two empty beds? No. <laughs> Let me go look for the lady in the parka. She's not at the Quantum Hotel. It's a men, men only, electrons only. No nuclei here. Um, so he's going to go over to this one, and he's not going to choose to sleep upside down. He's going to sleep up right side up, right? And then the third one comes in, and he's going to sleep over here. Now the fourth electron comes into the room. What's he going to do? You're not allowed to sleep on the floor. Well, he's got to sleep upside down with somebody. doesn't really matter. So this is the idea. When we're filling degenerate orbitals, 
we fill them singly first with parallel spins. So they're going to go right side up, right side up, right side up, and then come back. So if we look at, at that as an orbital diagram, the 2p would look like this. There are three orbitals in this sublevel. They all have the same energy. And so the electrons will go in right side up, right side up, right side up, and the next one will come in and be upside down. Okay? Okay, so here's a summary slide of the Quantum Hotel, a discount resort for electrons, in this is case, chemistry land. So the first floor has one room. It's the S room. Second floor has two rooms, S and P. Third floor has three rooms, S, P, and D. The fourth one would also have um, an F room. Um, each S room has one bed. P rooms have three beds. D rooms have five. F has seven beds. Okay. And the rules are only two people per bed, and you, you have to sleep opposite. I put opposite spins because sometimes the analogy means different things. This semester, it's sleeping upside down. Um, so here are the correlations. A floor is the principal shell or principal energy level that corresponds to the principal quantum number, one, two, three, four. The room is the sublevel or subshell. Each of the beds is an orbital. So in the P sublevel, there are three P orbitals, one along the x-axis, one along the y-axis, one along the z-axis. There's three of them. They have the same energy three beds in the same room. Um, electrons are people, and energy is equated to money. So a lower energy sublevel is a cheaper room. Okay? And you go to a hotel room, and there's more than one bed, you get charged the same regardless of which bed you sleep in. Right? So within that sublevel, the orbitals have the same same energy. And these electrons are cheap. This is a discount resort, after all. So the electrons come into the hotel, and they're going to take the cheapest room they can get. And they would rather share a bed than pay more. And they're really cheap. So if we take that same table, this is the hotel. So this is the first floor, n equals 1. This is the second floor, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, etc. So this is one room, and here's a room, and here's a room. And each of those lines is a bed, right? So if, if you want to extend the analogy and try to understand, well, well, why is the 3P room more expensive than the 3S room? Well, maybe because it's further down the hall from the elevator, it's quieter. Maybe it's further from the ice maker. Maybe it's got a better view. I don't know. But you can come up with some sort of a reason, right? So any questions? So. When we're looking at electron configurations, um, let's see, let's, let's look at nitrogen. So nitrogen, kind of like a bus coming up. How many electrons are on nitrogen's bus? Seven. seven. So nitrogen has seven electrons. So if the seven electrons are going to come stay in this hotel, where are we going to put them? So we're going to, the first guy goes in here, and that's the cheapest place. And the next one, ooh, there's still a, a place in that, that cheap room. The next one has to go to a more expensive room. And then up here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. He's going to take his own bed. It doesn't cost any extra. There's seven, right? So that's how they're going to go in. If it was oxygen and there was one more electron, he would pair up with this guy. So the electron configuration is like what the front desk clerk might take notes on so that he knows where all the, all the um, 
people are. So you say, okay, well, in the 1S room, I had two people. In the 2S room, I've got two people. In the 2P room, I've got three people. So, so that's what the electron configuration does. It says, how many electrons are in this sublevel, this 2P sublevel? If you look at the exponents here, 2 plus 2 plus 3 equals 7. So the exponents should all add up to the number of electrons in that atom. Okay, any questions? So just some notes. Um, unless it's stated otherwise, when we say electron configuration, we mean the ground state, the lowest energy. What can happen, and we'll see today, is if you excite an atom, if you put some energy into it, that energy will later come out as light energy, right? It won't stay in there. What happens when you put energy in is an electron moves to a higher energy orbital. And so that's a little bit like, you know, one of these electrons, he went and played the slot machines, and he won some money. So he comes in and he's like, well, hey, I've got all this cash burning a hole in my pocket. I'm going to splurge and stay in a more expensive room tonight. But he can't maintain that, and so he has to come back down later. Sometimes we'll ask you, we may ask you to write an electron configuration for something in an excited state. But if it's not specified, it's always the ground state. Uh, number of electrons, remember, is in a neutral atom is equal to the atomic number, so it's all right up there on the periodic table. Um, it can be a little hard to understand how these negative electrons can be together in this same orbital. Okay, and that's where we can't really, we have to acknowledge that uh, electrons are not just particles, because that that's hard to get around. But they are also waves. And so the waves, when you have opposite spins, is more like being in phase or out of phase. And so then we've got different things going on. And so the parallel spins have a correlated motion that minimizes their repulsion. And so that's, that's why they do it that way. And then the number of electrons that we can have in each of these sublevels. OK. so. We list the, the sublevels in the order of filling when we write an electron configuration, in order of filling. So if this is the electron configuration for krypton. It's got 36 electrons. Notice the 4s comes before the 3d. If you write the electron configuration with these switched around, it's not correct. When we've got a lot of electrons, you know, some of them have a lot more than 36. It can get a bit tedious to write this over and over and over again. So we have a shorthand notation called the noble gas configuration. And what we do is we take um, the previous noble gas. So rubidium has one more electron than krypton. Krypton is a noble gas. This is its electron configuration. So the electron configuration for rubidium, you see this part is the same. That's the same as krypton, right? And this is the only thing that's different. So as a shorthand, instead of writing all of that business, we write krypton in brackets. That stands for the electron configuration of krypton and then this 5s1. So that's the shorthand. You should be able to do both and to understand what both mean. So here are, um, we've already looked at hydrogen and helium. Here's the next four on the periodic table. Um, so here's the orbital diagrams. Um, each sublevel is going to be separated by a space and be identified. So here's the 1s and the 2s. The 2p sublevel gets three boxes because there's three orbitals. So this is like one bed and one bed. And here's three beds, but they're together because they're all in the same room. And we fill them up with electrons um, going from the lowest energy first. And when we get to one like this, they're going to pair 
uh, I'm sorry, they're going to fill up um, with parallel spins instead of sharing um, the first orbital. And then these are the electron configurations. Any questions? So let's do an orbital diagram for argon. And then it says determine the number of unpaired electrons. So when we look at carbon, how many unpaired electrons does carbon have? Two. There are two electrons in the hotel that have their own beds, right? And boron has one. Beryllium, all of the electrons are paired, zero pair unpaired. And lithium has one that's unpaired. The number of electrons, or whether there are unpaired electrons or not, has an effect on some of the properties of, of the element. OK, so an orbital diagram. I haven't shown you on the periodic table yet, so I'm going to just write the order of filling up here. 1s, 2, I'm sorry, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, I didn't actually need to go that far, but that's okay, 4p. So how many electrons does argon have? 18. So argon has 18 electrons. So let's, let's draw some diagrams here. So there's the 1s orbital and a 2s. And then when we get to P, the 2P sublevel, there are three boxes there because there's three orbitals. And next comes the 3S, and then 3P. So then we just count and put the electrons in there. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They'll take their own beds if they can. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So that's the orbital diagram for argon. How many unpaired electrons? Zero. Zero unpaired electrons. Any questions? Zero unpaired holds constant for all of the noble gases. All the noble gases are zero unpaired, yep. 